It's a cool and windy late afternoon here in South Texas and it is finally fall. It's about 21 degrees today, about 70 Fahrenheit, somewhere around there. And the wind is actually making it feel a little bit cooler. It's coming out of the north, which is a sure sign here in this part of the world that it's fall. But the extended forecast says it might not be completely fall yet. We're gonna warm back up into the upper 20s and low 30s. So I'll take this while I can get it. I've got, I don't know, about an hour and 15 minutes planned before the sunset. I've got breath in my lungs. I'm out on the bike. Let's get it. I know it's been a little while since I've made one of these. I think the last you saw, I was in New Hampshire visiting my family and that was late August. I came back here to Texas in early September and started student ministry at Texas A&M University as a college pastor here. And the weather was just so, so hot, unbearable to be outside and ride. So I'd really just kind of go out early in the mornings or as the sun was setting and really just focus on getting a little workout in. So, but now that the weather's cooled off, hey, we're back. Days of longer shadows and earlier sunsets have begun and I am so here for it. Let's go. As I'm sure you know, it's been a couple of weeks now since the terrorist organization Hamas in the Middle East attacked Israel and brutally, absolutely, brutally murdered women and children, slaughtered soldiers in the Israeli Defense Force. Just absolutely unprecedented, brutal attack. The worst since the Holocaust, actually. And that is just so heartbreaking in so many ways. So I wanted to add my two cents to the conversation not necessarily around the politics or the humanitarian thing, but specifically around how a disciple of Jesus should be thinking about and processing the events going on with Israel in the Middle East. I think you can generalize the power struggle that's going on there and kind of boil down the why to three different reasons. And this is of course no exhaustive list, but I think you can lump a lot under these three categories. First, why is it happening? Why was the attack so brutal? Why is there bloodshed? Why is there animosity? Number one, the sin of man. Humanity loves power and money and influence and fame. And from both sides, in any kind of conflict, that's really one of the things that it boils down to. We don't like to walk in humility. We don't like to serve other people. We don't like to be unrecognized. And we like to have all the power and all the wealth. That's just our wicked hearts at play. And I think, yeah, that's <laughs> most definitely going on with both sides in the Middle East today. There's so many grass puppies out today. It must be their day. They like the cool weather. The second thing I would say would be the reason why this conflict has escalated to where it has is because 
of the rage of the powers, the rage of Satan and his minions. And this is an important one for Christians and disciples of Jesus to understand because God has elected or chosen the people of Israel for a specific role. Genesis 12, 3 says, in Abraham, and then later on his descendants, all the other families of the earth would be blessed. God has chosen them for a role to be the vehicle of blessing for the rest of the nations. And God has bound himself to that people by a covenant. A covenant he's not gonna soon break. He's attached his name to them. His reputation is at stake that he actually does what he says. And so the powers know this. <laughs> they know that a day is coming when the God of Israel alone will be exalted above all the other powers and all the other gods. He's gonna throw them all into a lake of fire and their influence over the nations will be no more. They know. third reason, along with the sin of man and the rage of the powers, is the covenantal discipline of God. This is a hard one. In Deuteronomy 28, a really famous passage in the Torah, Moses lists blessings for obedience to the covenant, to the instructions that God gave Israel, and curses for the disobedience of those instructions. Now, if you've ever read that chapter, you'll know how many more curses there are in that chapter than there are blessings. It's not to say that the blessings aren't awesome, but man, the curses are there as a warning. of those curses we've seen play out in history as Israel's been scattered away from their land and famine and pestilence has come on them and unspeakable things have happened to them as a people since this covenant that they made with God at Mount Sinai. And I think as disciples of Jesus, it's really easy to either think in many ways, and I suppose I should make some videos on this in the future, but in many ways that Christians have somehow replaced Israel in terms of God's covenant chosen people. I don't believe that's the case at all, or that the atrocities that have happened to them over the centuries are somehow a sign of God's rejection of them, as opposed to him upholding his end of the covenant. God is insistent that this people actually be holy. And as a loving father does, he disciplines his son so that they might actually walk in the right way and thrive as he intended them to. The Jewish people are actually gonna be stewards of the tree of life and God in their midst. In the world to come, this is where it's all going. They have to be holy. This is a big deal to God, friends, and as disciples of Jesus, this should be a big deal to us. So much more to say, but if th this has been encouraging in any way, like and subscribe. Leave me a comment down below. I'd love to hear from you and what you're thinking as well. Well, the sun is set, the deer are out, we've got to pedal home. So I'll see you all in the next one.